Welcome everybody to the seventh episode of the Babbling Heads Podcast. You have myself perspective. We've got Nantel. Shaq is a ghost mm-hmm. today. No, no, Shaq is busy with some stuff. He's not here today. Yeah, we've, got a, <laughs> we've got a very special guest and I, I'm going to leave that to Nantel to our, our introduce. Our first um, guest. So, um, yeah, we've got a guest called uh, Lasno. And um, dude, it is for me, it's an honor to have you here. Um, I know I spoke to you about the podcast and I did an idea for, for, for some time. And mm. you've always been the first one that I've wanted to be on the, on the, on the, um, on the podcast. I appreciate that. Man. Reason being, um, you know, hip hop, it works, it, it works like. It's, it's hip hop is a box, right? Mm-hmm. And it's it has become a box, and everybody in the box is they they wearing uh, avatars, mm. and the more uh, fame you accumulate, and the more um, notoriety you accumulate on your avatar, the more valuable you seem to the people in the box. Mm-hmm. And you and the, the this, this podcast is actually to get out of that box, man. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And you embody for me. Um, Somebody that that sees the, the box but just don't give a fuck about the box. <laughs> and I think that's that's part of the reason why I wanted you to be the first guy, the first guest mm. on the podcast. Um yeah. Hey, thank you very much, Nance. I really appreciate that. Cool, man. Cool, man. Um I have to warn you, I've got some videos <laughs> yeah, lined yeah. up. Footage. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's some footage that I got from you. Okay. Um, of you, and um, yeah, we can we can go through it and we can explain yeah, where yeah. you were, because I'm interested in your journey, not just mm. musically, um, your journey physically. We went to Peru and start. St- I think it was four or c- how many was, countries in a year? Uh, Peru, Colombia, Brazil, Holland, Czech, South Africa. But not just that, uh, the, the the journey inwards. Mm. I'm really mm. interested in that also now. Yeah. So I think you um, if you can just yeah. introduce yourself. Do you want to play the clip uh, first? I think wh- introduce yourself and while you while you uh, okay. introduce yourself, I'll get the clip. Okay. Well, um, I'm Laszlo. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. It's uh, funny what you said about the journey inward, because this is like really interesting indeed like this division that we make between inwards and outward right like to illustrate for instance like there is no inside or outside right because right now every single thing that you are seeing around you is literally light that's bouncing off surfaces going into your eye and the picture is getting made in your head yeah. see so i am not here i am inside of you mm. here i am inside your system so there is no difference between an inner journey and an outer journey it's all just one you that, go on that, an outer that, journey, you mm-hmm. go on an inner journey, go on an inner journey, you end up going on an outer journey. And that outer journey will lead to an inner journey. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that aspect exactly of duality. Yeah, exactly. I was, duality gonna, I was going to play the yeah. video just to, to show people that um, you've got to you drop truth bombs. <laughs> yeah. But you just drop one now. So. Yeah. Me... Hey, I'm Laz. <laughs> I was just chatting with a friend. And one of these insights... I would love, love to share with you. You see, the reason why the very things that you desire most from the very bottom of your heart are maybe not flowing to you as easily and effortlessly as you would love them to flow to you. And this reason is all here. It's your own mindset, your own mental conditioning, your own thought patterns that are in essence forming gates that are blocking the way. You see, source itself is a omnipotent, unstoppable, bottomless source of energy that can be fashioned into whatever manifestations you want to have in your life and delivers it right to your doorstep, if only you are open to it all. Now, in order to be open to it all, it's like, if you want to phone me, you've got to dial my number, man. You can't be connected with me if you phone a different number. So in order to connect with Source, you've got to be on the same wavelength. You've got to be in the same state of being. However, Source is in a state of oneness, and we are in a state of duality. Now, this obviously does not connect, because when we are in a state of duality, then we have beliefs such as there is sufficient, there is insufficient, they are rich, I am poor, 
this is easy, this is hard work. <laughs> this is going to come to me quick. This is going to take a long time. And uh, Source just listens to you, man. <laughs> and this is what makes it so difficult. So to serve yourself most and to serve your highest purpose as efficiently as possible, you have to let go of these limiting belief patterns. You have to be centered in the non-polaristic slash non-dualistic state of oneness. <laughs> I don't blame you, though, because uh, it's tricky, you know. I mean, society at large and cultural and with cultural conditioning <laughs> wants uh, wants you to stay in the state of duality, and they work really, really hard at it. Um, for example, they will have your roots for opposing teams. You know, they will have two teams play against one another in a sport match, and they want you to root for this one and be against that one. That gets you centered in duality. For example, consumerism, Coca-Cola and Pepsi, they even colored opposing colors on the, on the color spectrum, blue and red. They want you with every single advertisement to go for one, spend your hard-earned money on that, hard-earned, <laughs> and uh, neglect the other one. Same thing with politics. Let's say in the U.S., Republicans and Democrats, once again, blue and red, Opposing colors keeps you centered in duality. So distance yourself from all these culturally imposed belief systems and ideologies which do not serve you. Okay, I know they're nicely packaged in terms of this is fun, this is entertaining, this is uh, nice, you know, this is something that helps you enjoy life. But it's not that way, man. If you want to enjoy life, you've got to be in a non-dualistic mindset so that everything that you want can flow to you freely without you having these gates in the forms of thought patterns, belief systems, and uh, mental <laughs> ideas that are uh, shutting down in front of whatever wants to flow to you. You just got to be, man. You just got to be and let it come to you. There's nothing that you have to do. There are just things that you have to not do. You check what I'm saying? Well, I wish you much, much abundance. I wish you much love. Be centered in non-polarity. Be centered in oneness. Be one with all. And the one will send everything to the one. <laughs> much, much love. Peace out. Hey, I'm Lars. <laughs> it's like common sense as well. It's like common sense. The present, the present is a gift, and I just want to be. I put the B album, the first song. Um, yeah, you, you hit the nail on the head. Mm, thank you. It's quite a long video, man. I didn't <laughs> remember it being that long. <laughs> but I, I, I think at least now the, the the listeners and the viewers has got like a certain uh, perspective, no pun intended, <laughs> of what's name of 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 who you are or where you are now in your journey. Mm. Like, can you take us back mm. to where it started? I think we both met you as as a hip-hop artist, as mm -hmm. a graphic designer, going by the name of Cicatrix, and now that alias no longer exists. So mm -hmm. can you take the listener to that beginning and that? Because mm -hmm. I think that's the journey that we've been speaking about. Yeah, yeah. I think Cicatrix just does still exist somewhere, except uh, I'm no longer sticking that label on me. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but I can't have been building it for so long for it to suddenly be gone, you know? I mean, all the okay. music is still there, the energy I put into it is somewhere. Mm -hmm. So it's still there some way. But um, to start from the story, I mean, all the way back. So um, I was I was born in Holland. Maybe it's a bit too far back, but yeah, yeah, just fine, for the story. Yeah. I was it. born in Holland. Then um, nine days old, we moved to Sudan, to Darfur. We stayed in the middle of the desert in Darfur. Of course, my father's an anthropologist, so we would travel with him sometimes when he had to go work somewhere. Stayed in... Um, the deserts in Darfur for about uh, one and a half years, a year. I mean, didn't have any electricity. We had a fridge that ran on gas. People had to come bring us water in bags on uh, mules, you know. Sure. So really living out in the middle of nowhere in this little village, we were the only white family staying there. These people had never seen a white blonde baby before, you know. <laughs> so everybody coming to my mom like, ooh, <laughs> what is this? <laughs> And um, then eventually we had to leave because the rebel forces started becoming a bit active and they were targeting white people especially. You know? um, and about what year was this? This was 1990. Okay, 1990. Yeah. Okay. And um, 
no, they were targeting white people, especially, and we were the only white people in the mm. village. So how are we going to hide? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, you know, we decided to uh, no, go somewhere. We went to Kenya for a little bit and eventually came back to Holland. But um, in Holland, there was always this feeling like it's not home. Okay. You know, it's like a concrete jungle. People packed really on top of each other. And because things are so closely condensed, it's almost like their personalities are condensed. <laughs> uh, okay, okay, <laughs> if okay. this makes sense, mm. you know. And um, it just didn't feel like home. Anyway, so after um, that, we ended up moving uh, to Vietnam, stayed in Vietnam for some while, stayed in uh, Thailand. Vietnam lived there about two years. Thailand's a little bit shorter. And eventually went to um, Sierra Leone, Malawi, Cambodia. Cambodia started high school, you know, started primary school in Cambodia. Sorry, primary school in Vietnam, then continued primary school in Cambodia, then high school in Ghana, and um, eventually came to South Africa. You know, so through that whole journey, which was mostly in Africa and Asia, I mean, one thing that I really noticed is like my dad is a complete atheist, right? If you cannot um, see it, then there's no purpose for it. It doesn't exist. Okay. So this is the same way that I grew up as well, you know, being very uh, realist, very uh, atheistic. But then I went traveling through all these poor countries and I started to see like here I come from Holland where people have so much and they're not happy. Here people have so little, but they're happy. Mm. You know, so what is it that makes them happy? And I started to talk with the people and every single person started talking to me about God. Mm. So then I thought like, yeah, but if something that I cannot see doesn't contribute to my life the way that my father has instilled in me as belief, then how come these people seem to only have God and yet it's contributing so much to their life? You know, so that's kind of like shifted something in me a little bit. And I uh, just started to look more consciously at uh, things. Then um, eventually I met this girl, and this girl was Jehovah's Witness, right? And this was, uh, man, I was crazy about this girl. And the father had this thing of I had to study the Bible for two hours with him, then I could see his daughter for half an hour. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> okay. yeah, and, it, yeah. <laughs> and even more so, whenever we would all be talking together, I mean, the father and mother of this girl would keep going on with reasons from the Bible as to why we cannot be together. And the only reason they would listen to is reasoning from the Bible as to why we could be together. So I started to learn the entire Bible to basically defend our relationship <laughs> and to keep things good. And um, then the more I got into that, the, yeah, the more I started to see like, you know, there's a whole lot more about this than I ever realized. And then eventually that relationship ended because I realized that this is not my path, you know, it's not my thing. It's too closely knit of a... Uh, of, uh, classroom in essence you know each single religion being a different classroom that people yeah. can learn through was this in south africa yeah this was oh. in south africa okay. yeah so then eventually i left the religion but then i had this thing of like now i've studied this so i can't not study anything else i'm going to be lopsided as a mofo <laughs> <laughs> you know so i then thought okay well this was a monotheistic religion namely meaning that they believe in one god so yeah. let me first start studying the other monotheistic religions so i went to judaism and i went to islam you know, the two other main monotheistic religions started studying those in terms of uh, Islam, started reading the Quran, made some Muslim friends that I had discussions with. And in terms of um, uh, Judaism, I started studying the Kabbalah. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, so like more and more growth came. And then I started to think, yeah, but these monotheistic religions, I mean, most of all, cause the most shit in the world. Mm -hmm. I was thinking the same thing though. Yeah. yeah. And it makes sense because if I believe my God is the only real God and you come along and you say, yeah, but it's this God, I'm yeah. going to say, ah, blessed me. Yeah, no <laughs> coexistence. Know? Yeah, whereas if I believe that there's many gods, like Hinduism, for example, it doesn't matter if you come with a new God, it's like, hey, I didn't know that one yet. <laughs> <laughs> Let me learn <laughs> that one. Yeah, we learned mm -hmm. that one, you know, so it's fine. And then because of this, I kind of started to expand more into the Eastern uh, the Eastern traditions, you know, the Eastern philosophies. So yeah. I started to look more into Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism, uh, Zen. Okay. And then all these things just uh, came together. And then um, my research eventually led me to a, a very inspiring gentleman by the name of Terence McKenna. Okay. Terence, oh, wow. uh, Terence McKenna is an ethnobotanist, indeed, mm -hmm. studies the relationships between the evolution of mankind mm -hmm. and uh, the effects of psychedelic plants, psychoactive plants, and how they integrate into different cultures, and how those cultures ended up growing as a result. 
So I started studying his work, and he has this thing that he talks about a heroic dose on mushrooms, right? Mm -hmm. Psilocybin commences mushrooms and the exact way to do it, mm -hmm. which is 2.15 a.m. in a completely black room. You take five grams of mushrooms on an empty stomach, eat them dry without anything. You have joints lined up. Then at 3 a.m. you start smoking weed like crazy. And then the weed causes the psilocybin to be set off and you go poof. Isn't that like the God Hour as well? Like what they refer to as the God Hour? Yeah, yeah. In essence, the barrier between Earth and the cosmos is the thinnest at, during at that 3 time. AM. No, between 2.30 and about 3.30, 4 a.m. Oh, never knew that. That's interesting. Yeah. This is also why many writers, really inspirational writers, yeah. they do, write during this time. I do my best thinking that time, man. Because I sleep at you know, I, mm. I sleep weird hours. And that's a time where I'm at most at peace and I do clear thinking. Right? Yeah. That time, time yeah. There was times as well where I would be making, if, if I'm awake at that time and I'm making beats, would most of the times be the best things that I've been making. Yeah, yeah. 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 also for me, for writing lyrics, mm -hmm. meditation, yeah. yoga, or everything. And it's first of all because this uh, layer between Earth and the cosmos is thinner, right? But also if you look at every single living being like a biological antenna, Mm -hmm. Right. If you are the only antenna that's awake and all the other antennas are asleep, it's mm -hmm. going to be easier for you to pick up information from the cosmos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you're the only active antenna at that moment. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, so I did this ceremony and this was now one of my first proper psychedelic experiences, you know, because mm -hmm. I thought I don't just want to take it and party and do this mm -hmm. and that. I mean, like I can explore this world when I'm sober, yeah. you know, I want to explore something else, something deeper. So I had this experience with the five grams of uh, mushroom, which was a really, really um, interesting experience. And um, do you want to hear the experience? Yeah, oh, yes. yeah. We've got time. <laughs> okay. You're the guest today, so it's all you. Okay, for sure. I will share. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I was sitting in this room um, uh, in an apartment in Cape Town, all right? in uh, what used to be District 6. Mm. And um, my girlfriend was sleeping in the bedroom. And I was sitting in this room, completely everything black, eat my five grams of mushrooms, and now I'm meditating, waiting for 3 a.m. so I can start smoking. But I started to have this feeling like I'm looking around this black room and I started to feel uncomfortable, you know, like I have no idea what's gonna pop up or what's gonna happen. So I thought, nah, this is not a good start to a journey. I need to make myself comfortable and then I can go. So I thought, screw this, I'm going to go lay in the bed next to my girlfriend, still lights off, you know, and then I'll start smoking at 3 a.m. Then at least I'll be next to her, I'll be easy, I'll see what happens. So I uh, did this, and 3 a.m. came, you know, started smoking, went back into meditation after smoking. And since I've been a kid, what happens when I focus is there's a, a black screen, everything is black, then I kind of see like spots coming together and eventually these different color spots come together in a coherent vision. Mm. So it's either like a place or a person, but usually it's a whole scene with people included. Mm. And um, I was expecting the same thing to happen, but instead, I mean, especially because I'm on mushrooms, you know, I thought the same thing would happen, just more hectic. Yeah. And instead there was just this completely dark, just darkness, not even like black, but like a black ink. And I'm looking at this black ink thinking like, why is nothing happening, man? Like I'm just staring at blackness, you know, like what is this? And eventually these two drops, they fall in this black ink, like a, almost like this clear light blue gooey liquid that's dropping in ink, two drops, bloop, bloop. And as they drop, they stay in place. They start to come closer and closer to me. Was this an open um, eye experience or were you? This was still close eye, close okay. eye. And they come closer and closer to me they turn into lines. As they come closer, I see these are not dots or lines, right? It was two long beings that were sitting like this, mm. long elongated head, no nose, just slits in the front of their head, no lips, but they had a mouth, you know? Also bigger eyes than ours, but not as big as the greys that they describe as having these giant eyes, you know? Yeah. Like a gray light bluish skin, really long slender bodies and they're sitting on these chairs, floating chairs with really big backrest and solid armrests on the side. And they're sitting and they flow up to me and I notice these beings are glowing, right? Hence why from far away, it just looked like two lines coming towards me because this light was blinding me. Mm. And uh, as soon as I realize I'm chilling with these two beings, they say to me, we've been waiting for these events to aspire, we've got something to show you, right? Mm. 
And the first thing I think is, like, what are you going to show me? I don't want to die. <laughs> <laughs> and before I even finish this thought, they say to me, don't worry, you're not going to die. You know, and this communication that's happening is taking place. I suppose telepathically is the best word you can use to describe it because they weren't moving, I wasn't moving, but I could feel their thoughts coming into mm. my mind, being translated into what I could understand. There was no speech. There so was no say. speech mm. at all, no. Okay. But it was also not direct communication in terms of them putting English thoughts into my head. Yeah. They were sending me signals, my brain translated to English, and so I understood. Okay. And um, as soon as, uh, so they told me, you know, it's okay, you're not going to die, you're going to be all right. Now, the next thing that I'm thinking is, well, but now uh, will I be back? Even if I don't die, I still want to be back. They say, don't worry, you'll be back. You can tell your girl that you're leaving now, or you can tell her when you're back, you know, whatever you feel. Now I'm thinking, okay, I at least got to tell my girlfriend I'm going to go somewhere. Just now she wakes up, she sees me passed out, I'm not replying, you know, like she's going to start panicking. But then I think, if I open my eyes now, am I going to come back to this deep space that I'm in, yeah. right? And they said, don't worry, don't worry, open your eyes, you'll be back here. And this was so striking. I closed my eyes and I saw them. When I opened my eyes, I was completely sober in my room. The curtains weren't waving, no patterns, no nothing, just completely sober on five grams of shrooms. So just stop you there. I want to get back to that point, but mm -hmm. continue. I just, just remind me, of course, I'm going to ask you about that. Okay, for sure. Yeah. And um, I like, I sit there and I open and close my eyes like a few times, you know, just mesmerize the experience. Because I mean, I close my eyes, it's ink with these two blue beings floating, and I open my eyes and I'm in the room feeling completely sober, you know, literally. Tuk, 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 yeah. tuk. And um, so I, I not tap my girlfriend. I tell her, look, there's these two beings here. They say uh, they have something to show me. So I'm going to go somewhere. You know, don't panic. I'll be back. I'm just letting you know so that if you try to wake me or something, I'm out. Like, I'm not here. And um, she's like, oh, okay, cool. You know, went back to sleep. Wasn't really that interested, but I had to just, you know, warn her. <laughs> <laughs> and as uh, soon as I closed my eyes again, I saw these two beings. And uh, I told them, I'm ready. And this black ink went away. I found myself in a completely new space, which was um, a room where I was laying on the operating table. And you know the, the patterns from the matrix that are black with green numbers yes, flowing yes, down? Yes, yes, yes. Everything around me, including me, was a dark blue with light blue numbers coming down. Not numbers like patterns you mm -hmm. know, from some other language. And um, so I looked down at my body and everything was like this, you know, just this blue streaming energy. And I'm laying on this um, operating bed and I see it's like, it looks like a type of a hospital scene or some mm -hmm. kind of took me aback. And next to me, there were these three beings standing, one tall one and two short ones. And the tall one kind of ran this, uh, it looked like a, like a energetic remote control. <laughs> it's like this device also made it of this blue s streaming energy, mm -hmm. rents it from top to bottom, up and down. As it, I don't know if it's a he or a she, as it does this, mm -hmm. I feel this ball going through my spine, up and down. And later on, when I came back, my girlfriend said my body was like a snake, like it was okay. going in bed. Anyway, once this uh, it is done with that, puts this device away, one of the shorter beings takes uh, its hands, goes into my solar plexus, opens me up. And um, the other being goes to the corner of the room, to this cupboard, I guess you can call it, and uh, takes out this blue orb, and they comes back to me. He says, "This is to guide you, so you know where to go." And they put this orb into my solar plexus, okay. and close me up. As soon as they close me up, that space disappeared. I blink around again, and I'm again in this completely black space. But this time, it's not a black space like a uh, ink, like for lack of a better description, like previously. But it's a black space, like a real physical space, okay. you know? So I'm looking around and my vision is blurry. So I'm kind of like blinking a few times and I'm feeling weird as well. I'm feeling like weightless. Mm -hmm. And I blink a few times and I see like these pieces floating around me and I get my vision clear and I see it's pieces of metal that are floating around me. Then I look in the distance and maybe about 100, 200 meters away from me, there's this massive broken satellite is flying through space. And then I looked down 
Well, you can't call it down because you're in space. So there's no down, up, yeah. left, right. It's just, okay, I looked at my feet <laughs> okay, yeah. and I noticed this long purple cord going from my chest down to earth to South Africa. Book. So you had an astral projection. Into my head. Yeah, exactly. And once I realized that, like I'm in space, this is where it really started to get interesting. Because <laughs> once I was in space, I um, got drawn into this other space. And for my feeling, I was there for two weeks. Like time just but, became... Yeah. But time doesn't exist in like, Ex exactly. like as we know it. Yeah. So two weeks would be two seconds. Exactly. It yeah. could be. I was there for two weeks and I was, at this time, I just called him a blue guy. I had no okay. idea who this guy was. Mm -hmm. I just said, I was there talking with this blue guy, right, in this void for two weeks, and he was teaching me all this stuff, you know, just conveying information, downloading stuff into my mind, into my system. And whilst I was there, right, before I uh, started this whole trip, I set up all my recording equipment at home because I thought if I want to say something or I need to, like, register something, then at least my mic is standing there. I don't need to wake up right down. I can just speak while I'm in this trance and I'll listen to it back when I'm back here. So I had everything set up. Now, whilst I was in that space talking to the blue guy, right, a different being came into my body and recorded two hours of audio on this laptop. That's what I was going to ask now, like... If you are having an out-of-body experience, so to say, mm -hmm. astral projection, um, and you're having these beings or energy speaking to you, um, and you're supposed to be in a certain level of sleep, how are you then speaking? But okay, mm. it kind of like answered the question because I was going to ask now, like, how does that happen? Yeah. But, okay. Yeah, well, but you can speak on many different levels, man. You know, I mean, we have the physical level, the astral level, mental level, emotional level, etheric level, and then you have the causal level, and then above mm -hmm. all of that, the source. Yeah. You know, all of these are different dimensions that we exist on, and on each single dimension, you can speak. Yeah, but you you had the 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 recording, or you had the mic set up yeah. to record, and oh, like whereas I, I was out. Yeah, you were out. I see. But then you said like this other being then yes entered your body, and then the recording took place. So it wasn't technically. You, as in, let's say, Laszlo now speaking, it was somebody speaking for you. Yes. Which is technically also you. But okay, I've got to yeah. now start to make sense with myself <laughs> as well. But, and, and the funny thing is, this thing addressed me as Laszlo, speaking as something to me. And this entire recording was about how planet Earth will go on regardless. You know, even if there's only five trees left after we destroy everything else, these five trees will just repopulate and in millions of years, the Earth will be green again. So it's not about saving Earth for the mm -hmm. sake of Earth. It's about saving Earth for the sake of us. Because yeah. if we stay the cancer, then the cancer is going to get mm. chemo. It's yeah, going to exactly. get out. Mm -hmm. And this was what this recording was about and about how I can, in essence, help this uh, expansion of awareness take place on planet Earth through my music. Okay. Right. So it was like instructions, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And um, once I came out of this space, I, uh, I basically I came back into my body and I was so shocked that I was back as you started to yell out things in Dutch. <laughs> you know, my, my, my birth language. I just started mm -hmm. to yell out things automatically like, ah, like I'm back, I'm back, I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> and um, girlfriend uh, shot awake. And, but now that this had happened, I started to get this really uncomfortable feeling like what I just did we are not supposed to do, and we are not even supposed to know that we can do it mm -hmm. because it gives us too much power, Yeah. right? Because I mean, if you can go travel to outer space and communicate with any enlightened being, then what can the government do? Yeah. <laughs> I think it, also, it, it, it lends itself to that thought of, like we were talking about monotheistic uh, religions earlier on, like, and that would be one of my, 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 my questions later on. It's like, what's your take on religion and spirituality? Mm. Is that like, I've always seen, especially the monotheistic religions, as suppressing the the ability for people to know who they actually are, or beings, mm. human beings to actually know who they actually are. Where spirituality is more that, I won't say technically direct link, but it is a link to make you understand, you know what, you and the source are kind of one. Mm. Yeah, I, in that clip you also said the one um, you're waiting for the one to talk to the one because in, the, in essence 
that's what we are. We're not separate of anything else. Mm. We're all together. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm trying to understand yeah. your experience and how it links to my experience with on, on psilocybin, uh -huh. where my, I mean, I've never done a heroic uh, dose yet, but my experience is um, it was inward. It was, it was by the way, um, my reason for getting out of, of um, my depression. Okay. I, 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 I attributed to, to, to psilocybin. Okay. Um, so you got out of your depression. Yeah. Okay. Um, but mine was more, I could see, I could see the dimensions flutter, mm. if it makes sense. And I, and I can't explain it really. I could just see that there is more than, than this round. That mm. But I'm trying to figure out, if you went to outer space, right, was it in the same dimension that, that we are? Or, or how, do, how does it, I, I'm trying to make well, sense when of I it, astral, my experience. When I was in outer space, it was the astral dimension. Because okay. it wasn't my physical body that was there, it was the astral body that detached and went on the journey. Okay. I think the simple yeah. way of, 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 of making sense of that, it's like we were watching Dr. Strange last night because <laughs> my son is now into all this Marvel thing and he was like, uh -uh. okay, I watched Avengers, but who's that dude? So I was like, okay, now I'm going to play Dr. Strange for you. There's this one point where the, the previous guardian hits his astral body out of him. Mm. And so it's, it's kind of like, I mean, if I need to explain it to somebody as simple as possible, it's like, it's basically your your soul, so to say, is just like gets moves out of your body. Mm. But um, that's another question as well. Like people, I've heard people also say that like um, a lot of times we think that the soul is inside of the body when the soul is actually all encompassing of mm. of it. It doesn't necessarily live in the body. It could be actually over like the force field around the body as well. Yeah. What's your take on that? Yeah. I mean, every single thing, like your body, your emotions, your thoughts, all happen within the space that is you. Okay. Right? Um, yeah, and that's basically as plain as it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that deep. Yeah, I ask you, um, so I've been studying, if you can call it that, like, like DMT journeys, never been on one. And what I've discovered lately is where they say that entities are planting... Um, not chips, but almost like a biological um, tracker in the heads. And the reason why they're doing it is because they're not supposed to be in the realm. So now I, I can, it, it, it reminds me of what, you, what you're saying, that mm. you shouldn't actually be there. I think, uh, are, are you referring to, when you said you're not supposed to be there, are you referring to, um, let's say, the, the, the um, I'm going to use this word loosely, the overseers of, of, of society yeah. not wanting us to be there or is it those beings there feeling that we shouldn't necessarily be it's there? The no, it's, it? it's the overseers. So it's the, uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, For okay. my feeling, it's the overseers. Yeah. I mean, I mean if, if you look at it as well, we were talking about it earlier as well, it's um, we're governed by our five senses here on this on in this paradigm as mm -hmm. well so i mean if I, you actually mentioned in the clip as well about the, the the two opposing colors with the pepsi so they're playing both sides the mm. reality um they 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 do things to keep you um kind of centered right here in this paradigm based on your senses mm. not knowing that if you knew that if you can transcend your senses well then that's when you can find exactly. out more. Exactly. Yeah. The, in, in ancient Japan, the judoka, the so judo masters, mm -hmm. when the student got to a point where he was about to mm -hmm. surpass the master or be on the master's level, this master would trigger a certain uh, pressure point in the student's neck to effectively kill him. Oh. And then the students would experience what it was like to die, would see that death is an illusion, then the master would bring him back. Oh. So that the students would be able to fight not believing death is not real, but knowing if they kill me now, I'll find myself in a different body. And this is such a source of power. Because in our culture, the taboo that we have made out of death is what limits everything. It means so many of our fears come forth from this primal urge of death. Even your entire fight or flight response is from this fear of death. So if there is no fear of death, and you can be still. Yeah, I think also like I, I, I read it somewhere as well that like when 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 kids are born, <clears throat> they don't know that they're gonna die. Mm. Yeah, there's this there's, there's basically two fears that they have: not being left alone and falling. Mm. 
So they don't know <laughs> that they're going to die. We end up telling them that, like, you know, oh, you are going to, you know, your life is going to come to an end. Now, imagine you don't tell somebody that. Like, yeah. how different won't their perception of yeah. reality be? It's like Siddhartha. Oh, like who? Siddhartha is the prince who became the, who we now know as the Gautama Buddha. Okay. His father was a prince. And before Siddhartha got born, this priest told his father, look, your son will be born and he'll either be a great king or he'll be a great holy man. Mm -hmm. And his father, obviously being a king, thought like, I don't want my son to be a damn holy man. <laughs> you know, I want him to be a king also. So Siddhartha's father shielded him from every single thing that could stir up some sort of spiritual appetite, mm -hmm. including that he didn't let his son know about death, didn't let his son have contact with anything related to death, anything related to illness. See, until one day, Siddhartha got out of the palace himself and he saw that people are sick, people are dying. And then he realized, hey, but this is going to happen to me. So no matter what I do, no matter how many riches I have, this is still going to happen to me. Mm -hmm. you know? And that is when effectively he started his journey to find a way to end suffering. You know, once he saw what had been hidden from him the entire time, namely what you say and the fact that we're going to die. Yeah. yeah. But I think also it's like, I, um, I think that's, that's like a, a lot of, of, of religions and um, spiritual, spiritual teachings, or this is just based on religion for now. Um, a lot is made up about like, you know, um, the dying part and heaven and so forth and so forth, but also trying to atone for what your, your shortcomings while you're here. And I think that's what has always intrigued me then about Egyptian mythology, because they were like, look, we can see what's happening here. We want to know what's happening after we die. Mm. Like the whole thing was after you die what happens mm. then because we can over the eons we've had people answer and we, we, we're still learning things about this planet and about our existence right now but over the eons people have kind of explained like what life is mm. nobody can explain what death is or what happens after or the perception of what death is mm. so i've been very intrigued by is um egyptian mythology if that's mm. concerned. yeah I haven't gotten too much into Egyptian mythology myself, mm. but it's very interesting, yeah. I find it really interesting as well. People always wonder about what happens when you, after you die, yeah. but never what happened before you were born. Yeah. It's really interesting, yeah. Because, yeah, it's weird. There's, it's really there's, weird, there's, there's whereas the, it's the same thing. Yeah, <laughs> because there's, there's the, the notion or the thought that, like, when you die, the light that you see is the light that you see when you're being born. Like, that's that's the... Um, the notion, yeah. Yeah, like the light you see is basically the next vagina you're coming out yeah. of. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what they say. I, yeah, I find it weird that we, even we as humanity, we don't really know our history or, or mm. like um, a solid proof as to where humanity started from. Mm. Yeah. That's why the the, 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 um, the Sphinx and all that fascinates us because we, 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 we don't have a clue what, mm. what's happening in this realm, yeah. let alone what happened before we entered this realm. Yeah. yeah. It's always yeah. like the unexplainable man, like like um with the Sphinx and, and the pyramids, for instance. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, they want to say like, it's, it was beings from outer space, or they will say like, okay, it was the Egyptians themselves, they were mm -hmm. of a higher level at that time. Um, but they can't explain exactly how it was made, why it was made, all those things. Um, yeah, and, and there's, there's unexplainable mm -hmm. stuff. But I think it's also, it's purposely kept away. I think it's, it comes down to that... Um, that overseers thing that we just mm. spoke about. It's, it's purposely kept away because yeah. if you've got like how much billion people are we on this planet now? About six, seven. Six, seven billion. Eight, maybe. Yeah. Maybe 15. Could be. <laughs> so most of us would be like four billion. But yeah. So, so we, like, how do you keep all those people in check? Uh -huh. You know, it's that simple. That's how I look yeah. at it. It's like, if we, like you're saying, if you can effortlessly travel out there to space, and like I mean, if you can do that, then what more can't you do? Mm. Do, you, do you know that the the um, I think it's the U.S. government is um, pro they've got um, patients and they're prolonging the DMT uh, experience to study and map it. Mm. Okay, you're talking about uh, Dr. Straussman. I'm not. I'm not actually sure. I, th I think it's happening in the states or it's happening. I think it's Cambridge. 
Mm. Really. I, th I think it's Dr. Eric Straussman you're talking about, yeah. But it's this experiment you're talking about where they had different volunteers on hospital beds in a very good setting and they basically dripped the DMT mm. into their arms every 15 minutes. Yeah, because yeah. the smoking is, is it, 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 it's just it's a short mm. um, experience, but they obviously want to map it and it needs more, you need more time to do it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but even for how they did it, it's in essence, I mean, every 15 minutes. Actually, I'm not sure about this. I wonder if in their case, every 15 minutes when they drip more DMT into the system, if it would then be a new jump mm -hmm. or if they would stay where they've already jumped to. Mm -hmm. I have no they would be curious. I just okay. want to play this. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, I saw this kid. Working with Madre Ayahuasca. So when <laughs> I saw that one um, the first time, I was studying it, um, could say studying it, um, what ayahuasca is and DMT, and I was damn jealous, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I was loving, yeah. So. So I've only experienced like like a not a real heroic, but a, like a decent amount of um, those of, of, of psilocybin. Mm. So I want to know how how does it compare the, the the ayahuasca experience with with the the the, the, the shaman that obviously guides you? Because um, I remember I said uh, on one of the Facebook groups I said guys. Um, can you experience this at home, or do you have to go to to to, to Peru and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. And I think you you mentioned it, dude. It's not something that you just do at home. It's like a mm -hmm. whole journey. It's a process. You prepare yourself. Yeah. You have to you have to um, eat a certain way for five days. I think it's mm -hmm. a certain diet you need to follow. Yeah. So just take me for somebody that's that's got no experience in, in, in that. How does it compare? If it can be compared, how does that work? Mm. Well, first of all, the quality is very, very differently. Like um, mushrooms to me are a bit mischievous because <laughs> mushrooms feel like a person, but you always have to remember they're not a person. You know, it feels like they have this personality, but the personality can switch instantly. Mm -hmm. You know, like mushrooms, for instance, will convince you that something is true, even when it's not, because you need to believe that it's true to learn what you have to learn. Okay. That makes a hundred percent sense to me. Mm -hmm. Like mushrooms can convince you that you're dying just so you can learn from the experience of believing you're oh, dying okay. even when you're not, for example. Right? Whereas with ayahuasca, it's uh, it doesn't feel like her personality changes. You know, it stays this loving mother. Mm. And she will always act from the point of view of a loving mother where if you are an egotistical child and you don't want to listen to the mother, then she'll have to slap you around so that you can come along with her. Whereas if you are easy, humble child, there's no reason for the mother to slap you around. She'll take you by the hand and teach you. Okay. And this is something that I experienced very strongly on ayahuasca, especially, I think it was like my, my fourth or fifth ceremony in Peru with this lady that's making the ayahuasca in the video, Selena. She was my shaman there. And um, I was really, really nervous <laughs> before this particular ceremony, you know, I just had this feeling of like being scared. Mm. And um, I drank the ayahuasca. And when she started to present herself to me, she just opened her arms. She took me into her heart and she asked me, boy, why are you afraid of your mother? And all this fear just went away. Wow. It went away completely. Because it's li like I say, like the personality of ayahuasca is the mother. That's why they call her Madre Ayahuasca. Okay. You now, personality of San Pedro, for instance, is uh, like what you must they call it, is the father. You know, and these personalities will always stay consistent. 
Whereas with the mushroom, the personality, like you think you know it, and then there's suddenly something different. You know, so it's uh, mischievous in that sense, I suppose. But, and then like this whole process that you, uh, that they recommend for uh, ayahuasca. In essence, with ayahuasca, you do have to be more careful because, I mean, ayahuasca has, I mean, it's a combination between chacuna, which is the DMT shrub that grows in the bottom of the jungle floor, and the Banisteriopsis capi vine, which is the vine that grows about 20, 30 meters in the top canopy of the jungle, okay. right? And um, what the Banisteriopsis capi vine does, it contains uh, monoemo oxidase inhibitors, mm -hmm. which basically inhibits the function of your body to process the DMT as quick. So what would otherwise be a 15 minute trip if you smoke DMT on ayahuasca is like four to eight hours, depending on how you breathe and your breathing work. If you combine holotropic breathing with ayahuasca, you can make it last like eight, nine hours, really, really long. Yeah. And you stay in that zone for a long time. But um, because it has these mono and emo oxidase inhibitors in it, it in essence changes your biology of your body. So there's a lot of things that your system is not able to process anymore. For instance, foods that is too fermented, mm. foods that have a lot of tyramine in it, which for example is cow cow uh, and Brazil nuts. And um, yeah, there's just a few different things <laughs> you oh, really need to so, watch. So, so the reason why you're going on a diet for five days um, well, it's, it's more than five. The five days, what they say for the tourists. Oh, yeah, because okay. the tourists. It's actually for, for it to work properly through. Mm. To, to, yeah, it is firstly for it to work properly, but secondly, the point that I just made is that you don't want to put your system in a state where you cannot process certain stuff yes. and you can literally make yourself sick because if you have too much tyramine in your system, you start to get headaches and you yeah, know, and you cannot process the tyramine. Yeah, I think that's with any plant based medication as well. It's like, the world, like I've heard people say, some herbalists actually say that if you've got a whole lot of junk in your body, so to say. Mm -hmm then you might f um, feel sick before you actually start yeah. feeling better. Yeah. 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 And that's it also that every single thing about your system, not even with ayahuasca, but your system in general is about purity. Purity is key. If your own system is pure, it's energized and it's conscious, your whole life will automatically become pure, energized and conscious. So when you, do you mean like an alkaline state? Or not necessarily. Uh, not, not an not alkaline state. Like for example, if you would, if you would work with um, psychedelic medicine to cleanse you out, mm. right? And you would be on a diet of basically just um, vegetables, nuts, maybe a bit of rice, a bit of lentils, you know, then your system would just automatically purify itself. And this is the thing that people don't understand. A lot of people that in life you attract to yourself what is inside of you. You see, every single thing in life, since everything is energy, vibrates on a certain frequency, right? Now, if I want to attract something in my life of a certain frequency, I first need to have this frequency in me. I need to embody it. For example, money is on the same frequency as your sacral chakra, yeah. your stomach, you see. So if your stomach is pure, your stomach is clean, automatically you attract money. It can't go any other way. It just happens. And I know this because I've, I've seen it for myself. I mean, I speak from experience. That's, mm. I used to always have trouble with money. And after coming to Peru, going through all the stuff and continuing my work, it, like, it just flows. It just flows. And there's nothing that I have to necessarily do for it. I mean, one job could end and here another job just pops up. You know, it just that's, happens that way. It's funny you say that because, you know, like, like in our communities, we always hear the, <coughs> the phrase that, like, money is the root of all evil and all this stuff, you know, that, that, that type of um, mentality. And I was speaking to a friend of mine that now lives in London. And I know if, if we, we heard about or if he watched um, something on YouTube and he said, like, this person was speaking about money having the energy. So, like, like you just spoke now. And this person likened it to the sense of money is showing appreciation. Mm -hmm. So you're not buying something for the sake of like, or when you are buying something, you're paying. You're paying the person that made it as appreciation. Like, I appreciate that you made this mm -hmm. and now I accept that. But we don't look at it like that. 
We're yeah. not looking at money in, in that sense because we don't believe that it's an energy at all mm. or even it vibrates at a certain frequency. So that's that's actually cool. Yeah. This is actually a, this is actually a really interesting points, man. Because mm. it's true, yeah, that when we buy something, even though we're giving away this useless paper to gain something that's useful to us, we don't see it as in we're gaining something. We see it as in we're losing something. Yeah. Because we're losing money. Exactly. <laughs> but we're not. We just we're just showing our appreciation. Yeah. That's what the money is exactly. for. Exactly. And the money you can't do shit with. But yeah. what you're getting with it, you can. And still exactly. we feel like we're losing something. Yeah. <laughs> but I used to be in the same vibe though. I also used to have this thing of like to be to be properly spiritual, to be in tune. I shouldn't care about money. Yeah. Right? Because that's kind of the vibe that people always give off. The misconception. Yes. Yeah. And then because of this, I used to have judgments about rich people. You know, I'll see somebody with money in a nice car and the first thing I have this feeling of like, ah, oh, fuck you, why do you have such a nice car? Yeah. Or be like, ah, I probably cheated someone. Or he probably like got through this through some uh, bastardly means, you know. And um, then I went to my uh, to Vipassana retreat here in Worcester, which is 10 days of meditation, 10 hours a day. And no eye contact, no communication, like just completely in yourself. And uh, twice a day, you get to speak to the guru. They fly the guru in from India to teach these students Vipassana meditation, which is the meditation that Siddhartha used to become the Buddha. They teach it for free. And then um, this guru, he told me, continue your Vipassana, purify your body, and you will see when your whole body is full of light, your whole life will be full of light. And you will see this in terms of opportunities, in terms of spirituality, in terms of family, but also in terms of women and in terms of money. And this is an enlightened guru oh, who tells me this. Like if you become full of light, automatically you attract money. Yeah. You know, so then I kind of had this click like, well, if I'm going to stay on this path and attract it automatically, then who am I to not simply receive and say, I don't want this. Yeah. And this is a really, really interesting thing too, man, that I've come to realize on my journey that a lot of people have an inability to receive and then they blame life for not giving them enough. Yo, <laughs> you know, um, I was speaking to a friend of mine yesterday. You're talking about people have an inability to receive. Mm. There's actually an inability to ask as well. Like yeah. we don't know how to ask for stuff. Yeah. Like, yeah, I, I was to TED talk about mm. this, this, this girl. Um, she's a performer of um she's a, she, she busks um she's a theater um actress um she's a singer blah 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 but her whole thing in her, her ted talk was about the art of asking mm. and how she got to the point of realizing that we don't actually know how to ask but uh, it's yeah. in the same breath as well we don't know how to receive as well yeah it's also uh, interesting I but being able to ask i would rather just do it myself type of thing yeah, yeah. It, you just make your life a bit more difficult yeah especially if you don't have the skill yeah the skill set to begin with yeah, yeah. You, you you mentioned so, about the um the, the the misconceptions of like when you are spiritual then you know you can't live like a mundane life or you know um or you can't be into what society into the money and all that stuff yeah um I think that also lends itself to the duality thing. It's like because we see everything as a left and a right, as a good and a bad, light and darkness, whatever, we not seeing that all of it is actually the same thing. It's just varying degrees of mm. the same thing. Yeah. You know, like the, they always ask the question, like, um, when do you know, where, where does hot end, where does cold begin? Like the temperature. It's like just basically the varying degrees of the same thing, temperature. Yeah. Um, what do you think about... Yeah. Like you mentioned, light, like the the um, the the guru that was teaching that, that they flew down and talking about like until your whole body is light and stuff like that. There's, I think, there's another misconception that I've found online where people is like, I'm either doing light spirituality or I'm do, doing the dark arts or whatever. What's your your take on that? Um, I think. A lot of people in the space, they believe that to get enlightened, they must eradicate the darkness. Mm. It doesn't work. By becoming enlightened, you make the darkness conscious. And it's exactly how it is. Like Gautama, Gautama means light and darkness in one. Hence why they call him the Gautama Buddha. Okay. You know, if there's any part of you that 
feels like a demon to you is basically a demon because you have not given it love, yeah. because you have not accepted it. Mm -hmm. And I've come across people in Peru, because when I was staying with Elena, my shaman, I mean, I stayed there for six months, and uh, I saw a lot of people that would come there, stay there for a few days, prepare for the ceremony. Then they would go, not do a ceremony with her, but go to a more expensive place, which I couldn't afford. Yeah. And they would go there, do the ceremonies, then come back to Elena's place, chill there for a few days before going back home. So I got to see a whole lot of people chilling before the ceremonies and then after their ceremonies. And the difference you see in people is amazing. But the biggest difference I saw in people were people that would tell me that they saw a demon pop up in front of them and all they could do was give this demon love. And with those people, I could really see beforehand there was something bothering them. They were uneasy. They were jumping, always having to like go get tea, go make food, go read a book, always having to do something because there was this uneasiness in their core. And then once they had faced a demon, a literal demon, you no know, appearing to them and them giving it love, once they had done that, they were easy. Of course, it's self-acceptance. That's. Can I just mention okay. that? That makes sense to me because when I went through my depression, a lot of people just said, um, just be positive. Mm -hmm. where, where I tried to, 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 to tell them, dude, it's, it's not that, mm -hmm. it's easier said than done because yeah. mm -hmm. it's almost like your body, like, like I would say, um, let me think of something positive. Your body doesn't allow you, your brain doesn't allow you to. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So what's so an assignment was, was, was vital for me to get out of it because it was, I can't really explain it, but it was like, you need to accept the, the, the darkness and realize that yeah. everything, everything, like say, say, say you come out of the depression. It's not like, Every day is going to be just a positive day. Mm -hmm. As you're going to have your bad days, you're going to have your good days. But the thing is, when you accept that bad day, so, yeah. okay, this is a bad day. Okay, this is, it, uh, let me deal with it mm -hmm. now yeah. and just move on. And you know what I'm yeah. saying. So, so in the same in the same light, I can I can see that there's a the the, the demon that you need to face. You need to, yeah. yeah, but irrespective, I think irrespective um, what you do, the demon will always be a part of you. Type of thing. Yeah. Something that you may be not proud of, or um, like for me, it's it's an anger issue. You know what I'm saying? Mm. That I need to come come to come to, to, come to terms with, with you. Yeah. yeah, it's like what's name is like. Um, <clears throat> I touch on the the demon thing as well, but like I also suffer from depression as well as well for the longest time, and I was telling my sister as well like. I can end off my day like my day can start well. I can end off my day like bad. Mm. And of late, I would say for the last couple of months, so to say, I've got to this point where I just started to realize, you know what, as the sun sets, it rises, it rises the next day again, and there will be another opportunity for me. Yeah. You know, so that's like how I've kind of like just decided to navigate my depression. It's like, you know what, at the end of the day, I've got another chance. Like some mm. people die in their sleep, you know, then they don't have another chance in this reality, yeah. I've got another chance. So let me just... Dude, I actually, I'm actually glad I went to the depression. Eh? Yeah. Because uh, I, hope I, I hope you don't think I'm, I'm, I'm getting too personal. But no, no, um, when we were, we were, when I asked him to do the, the, the podcast, mm -hmm. it was probably a year and a half ago. Yeah. Um, and then I had to put everything in place or whatever. And I could see his depression because I could, I could see, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Um, I could see my, what I went through and I could see it in him when I went to go visit him. And for me, it was like, I needed to do this and, and remind him, like, dude, let's do this, man. Mm. For me, so so, so, so the podcast itself was, was a means to get him out of it and myself out of it. Mm. Because I, f I feel that once you focus on something, especially hip hop, or what, what hip hop used to be for me back in the day, what is it was, a, it was for me to focus on something and in the process, you think about stuff, mm. but you, you, your main your main um, attention is on this this yeah. the task that you need to do, mm. and and did you give you give it you don't give the depression that much clout. Yeah. So you can you can think about it. Okay, mm. so I need to do that and that in the process of doing this study. Yeah. If it makes sense. Mm. Yes, it's like what's in like we 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 kind of going off, but it's fine. But yeah, it's, that's, it's fine. It's, mm. it's the podcast. It's our but podcast. A, a lot of yeah. people do this for depression though. 
I think a lot of people get started on the spiritual journey because of depression. Yeah. Um, just to, 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 to piggyback on what you were saying, it goes like, I'll, I'll sign up for four hours.